Hi, this is Pastor Darrell Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Thursday, October 8th, 2015. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's so many things going on today. There's so much in the news that relates to Bible prophecy. It takes me about three times longer to scan through biblical prophetic news today than it did even a couple of years ago. It's everywhere. You know, we're hearing so many things in, in America about, oh, we've got to do away with guns, got to change the gun laws. You know, Obama actually hinting at confiscating all the guns here in America. Hillary Clinton saying, yeah, when I'm elected, I'm going to be changing all kinds of gun laws. Understand something. There's there's countries around the world that have done away with guns. You know, I, there's, there's places like uh, Australia, they've done away with guns, other places... Um, there have been tyrants throughout history that tried to do away with guns and then, you know, kill 20 million of their own people. The best way to defeat them is to take away their weapons. Um, in Israel, they do things a little differently. You see, in Israel, teachers at schools are packing. They're carrying guns. When they go out on field trips with their students... They've got some serious rifles and sidearms with them on these field trips. I witnessed this firsthand in Israel. I saw several classes and, and, and schools on field trips to uh, various places like the, the waterfalls, uh, uh, the Dead Sea, um, Masada, other areas. The teachers carry guns. In Israel, they haven't had a school shooting in over 50 years. It doesn't happen there. Today, in Jerusalem, out of the Jewish press, mayor of Jerusalem says, come out today with your guns. The mayor of Jerusalem said, everyone who has a license to carry a gun, please do so today. Bring your gun. Make your presence known. So all these hateful Palestinians, these Arabs, these Muslims that are killing our people, maybe they'll think twice. More guns, greater security. You see, in our country, they're trying to go the other way because they want to overcome us. They don't want to empower us. They want to overpower us. There's a big difference. Israel gets it. America does not. They think, oh, if we take away all the guns, there won't be any shootings. Yeah, there will. Criminals don't obey laws. They don't obey them now. Why do you think they're going to obey a gun ban? Just ridiculous. There's so many attacks going on in Israel. Out of front page mag, Palestinian terror wave, brutal attacks escalate. Why is the Obama administration silent in the face of Palestinian incitement and depravity? says the wave of terror attacks that Israel has experienced in recent days can be directly attributed to the leaders of the Palestinian Authority, Israel's supposed peace partner. They're no more a peace partner than the Nazis were peace partners to the British Labour government in 1938. We're hearing of all these attacks, like seven different attacks happened since I saw you yesterday, of Palestinians and Muslims attacking Jews, stabbing them, killing them, running them over with cars. Yet the UN's not saying anything about that. America's, Obama's not saying anything about that. They're talking about the Palestinians that are killed in these attacks when Israel responds with force. Really? You're going to talk about the response to the hatred Responding to a bloodthirsty terroristic killer with blood in his eyes, seeking Jewish blood. And when Israel responds and takes him out, oh, Israel's the bad guy because they killed this innocent Palestinian. Really? If he was so innocent, why did he have a knife in his hand? Why was he trying to stab Jews? This world is so backwards these days. I, don't, I feel like it, it's almost like the, the Matrix or something. Like we're going to wake up. You ever feel like you're dreaming and you just can't wake up from a dream <laughs> yeah one day we're gonna wake up in heaven and be like wow glad that's over because uh that was getting pretty weird down there 
Palestinians killing Jews left and right. Out of the Jerusalem Post, White House deeply concerned by escalating tensions in Jerusalem, officials say. Now, on the surface, this looks like a good story. Oh, White House is deeply concerned. Guess what they're concerned with? The deaths of Palestinians. They're concerned with the bloodthirsty killers who were seeking to kill people, innocent people, innocent civilians who weren't armed. The White House is more concerned with these Palestinians that are killed in response to them trying to kill somebody. They're more concerned with that than they are about the violence and the incitement coming from these Palestinians. They're missing the mark. They're not quite getting it. Obama just doesn't get it. It's amazing to me. How about this? Out of Israel, Hayom, Palestinian Authority pays fat salaries to terrorists who killed hundreds of Israelis. Documents prove that terrorists responsible for some of the worst attacks on Israelis got salaries of 52000 to 78000 each in 2013. Oh, you killed some Jews? Huh, let's see, how much is that worth? Here you go. Really? This is where we are, people. This is where we are. Palestinians look at these people that kill Jews as heroes. They name streets after them. They take care of their families. When these terrorists are killed, then the Palestinian Authority takes care of the family of the dead man who killed some Jews. They pay their house payments, their electric bills. Oh, sure, they'll pay their electric bills, but they don't pay the Palestinian Authority electric bill of over $600 million that's owed to Israel. Yet, if Israel turns off the switch and says, yeah, when you pay up, I'll turn it back on, like my electric company has done to me many times over the years when I couldn't pay, it's like, oh, you can't pay? Boink, hit the button, off it goes. Comes back on when you come up with some cash. That's how Israel should respond to these deadbeats that won't pay their light bill. Hmm. How about this? Out of the Times of Israel, the United States will not veto UN vote on settlements if, is, if Israel builds anew. It says, should West Bank construction resume in response to terrorism, Washington will not block resolution branding sell, settlements illegal, report says. United States reportedly issued Israel an ultimatum this week. Announced new settlement construction, and Washington will not veto a Security Council resolution declaring West Bank settlements illegal. What's next? America won't veto a, a vote for a Palestinian state? Isn't that called blackmail? Is, is that not still called blackmail where you're from? Because holding a carrot above someone saying, you need to do things the way we tell you to do it, or we're going to pull the plug. Uh, that's... The definition of blackmail. Do what I tell you, or you won't get a favorable response. Obama's blackmailing Israel. Do what I say, or we're not going to vote your way. He's holding true to his statement in his book that he would always side with the Arab and Muslim people. Palestinian people always side with them, always going to throw the Jews and the Christians under the bus, clearly. Did you hear about this? Benjamin Netanyahu's barring politicians from the Temple Mount. Out of the Jerusalem Post, Arab MKs are outraged as Netanyahu bars politicians from the Temple Mount. There's one guy who defies the Temple Mount ban, and he says Netanyahu has no authority here. Wow, that statement alone should resound with Jews all over the world. They're saying, yeah, Netanyahu, Israel, the Jewish people, they have no authority on the Temple Mount. You know, Israel did liberate their Temple Mount in the Six-Day War in 1967, and they handed over custodian rights to the Muslim walk, said, hey, yeah, here, you guys take care of it for us, okay? It's ours, but y'all take care of it for us. Make sure and do the right thing. You know, we're allowed to worship there. Yeah, not anymore, you're not. 
Sorry, no Jews. No Jews allowed. No Jews allowed. Nope, not on the Temple Mount. And don't even move your lips because you might be praying and you'll be arrested for that. I don't know about you guys. I'm so tired of this. I, I'm, I'm so tired of it. You know, it, it's like those those souls around the, the throne in, in Revelation saying, when, Lord, when? When will you redeem us? When? Are you going to take vengeance? When? I feel like I'm joining them. When, Lord? When? Make the truth known. Wash away the lies. Burn up the lies. Let's do away with this evil wickedness that goes against you. We're to pray for our enemies, Jesus said. We're to give them food when they're hungry and water when they're thirsty. That goes against every emotion that I feel for these people. I just want God to come down and set things straight. But we must continue to pray for our enemies, those who are enemies of God. Psalm 83 says your enemies make a tumult and it lists a whole group of different peoples and nations. And if you do a little research, every one of them is this day, this very day, they're all Muslim by nature. And yet the Bible calls them God's enemies. Important to know. Mostly because they deny the Son of God. They deny He died on the cross. They deny He rose again from the dead. They came out with another gospel that's no gospel at all. It's full of lies and half-truths, but that's the way the devil operates. When he tried to tempt Jesus in the, in the wilderness, he quoted scripture, but he misquoted it. He, he got it a little wrong, intentionally, I'm sure, because you know the devil knows the Word of God probably better than every Christian on the planet. He's had a lot more study time than we've had. Think about it. Some 6,000 years? Okay, so the first five books weren't written until, you know, maybe 5,500 years ago. Okay, I get it. But still, the devil knows the Word of God. That's why he can tweak it and twist it and use it against you. That's why you hear people even some preachers claiming to be Christians that are somewhat preaching from it, but they too twist it and tweak it and make it say what it's not intended to say. This is why Jesus warned us in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21 when they said, what will be the sign of your return? What will be the sign of the end of the world? In all three of those passages, Jesus said, first thing, watch that no one deceives you because many will try to deceive you. You'll see false teachers, false Christ even, false prophets. You know, this UN speech of Netanyahu last week when he was like staring down the nations of the world in that 45 seconds of silence because they all approved Iran to have nuclear capabilities when they've so many times threatened to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. He says, how can you approve this for a, 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 an administration that has threatened to wipe us out, threatened to kill us all, threatened to take us over, to annihilate us, to destroy us, and you've given them the ability to do so? You realize Obama pulled John Kerry and some others out of there right before that speech was to happen. Out of Israel National News says, why Obama pulled Kerry from Netanyahu's UN silent speech? Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's powerful speech in the UN last week was largely upstaged by, upstaged by the murderous Palestinian terrorist attack wave that began less than two hours later, and it hasn't let up yet. Um, he glared at the General Assembly for about 45 seconds. Um, the ZOA, the Zionist Organization of America, strongly criticized U.S. President Barack Hussein Obama for choosing to hold a video conference with Secretary of State John Kerry and UN Ambassador Samantha Power precisely during Netanyahu's speech. Obama pulled them from the UN hall while the Israeli Prime Minister was addressing the world body. 
Just as Arab countries have routinely done when Israeli leaders and representatives speak, isn't that interesting? Obama did the same thing the Arab and Muslim nations did. Hey, let's, let's leave. Netanyahu's about to speak. Let's go. We're not going to show him any respect. We're going to walk out of here and snub him, turn our backs on him. Obama's been turning his back on God since he took office. Saying we're no longer a Christian nation. Saying the, the Quran is the most beautiful thing he's ever read. The, the call to worship in the Quran, in, in Islam, is the most beautiful sound he's ever heard. While he mocks the Bible and he praises the Quran, he's been snubbing God ever since he's been in office. And here he is snubbing God's people. Yeah, let's walk out. And Yahoo speaking, yeah, okay, let's get some ice cream. He pulled them away, right when Netanyahu was speaking. What kind of message do you think that sends to the Arab countries, the Muslim nations? They're like, hey, look at this. Obama walks out on Netanyahu too. Hey, he's one of us. Yeah, he is. Clearly, he is. It's appalling for an American president to pull senior U.S. representatives from the U.N. General Assembly Hall ahead of the leader of any American allies address to the United Nations. Obama was not possibly unaware of the signal this sends to friend and foe alike regarding the U.S.-Israeli relationship. I don't care what he says, how he's got their back, he professes his value and he's going to uphold it. I'm going to go by his actions over his words because Jesus said you'll know them by their fruits. He didn't say you'll know them by their words. You'll know them by their fruits. And it's clear Obama is trying to help destroy Israel. He's trying to help divide Israel. He's going against God in so many ways. Mm, God help us. Did you see this? This story's been in all kinds of places. Um... Where am I reading it from today? Uh, Breitbart. Child ISIS terrorist taunts Obama, warns this dog of Rome to submit to caliphate or die. Here's this 10-year-old Islamic State fighter getting bold against Obama. A 10-year-old threatening Obama with his life, saying he's going to kill him. Saying Obama's dreaming if he thinks American soldiers will ever be able to infiltrate or reclaim territory that the caliphate now holds in control in Syria and Iraq. This 10-year-old said, if you think your soldiers will enter the land of the Khalifa and pollute it with their filth, then you're dreaming. <laughs> wow. Wake up from your sleep and pay the jizya, the, the religious tax. In submission before the swords of the caliphate reach you and cut your filthy head off. Threatening to cut Obama's filthy head off. I wonder how long I would remain free if I were to come out with a video and did the same thing. <laughs> Not very long, I can tell you that. We think we have freedom of speech, but try yelling fire in a movie house or bomb on a jet and see how far your freedom of speech goes. Just saying. Um, out of the Jerusalem Post, Ayatollah Ali Khomeini bans Iran from negotiations with the United States. The Ayatollah has come out and said, yeah, we're not going to negotiate with the United States over anything ever anymore. Really? Because the New Deal's not done yet. But I understand something. It's pretty much out of America's hands. Iran's now dealing with the rest of the world on that. They don't have to talk to America at all. Very interesting, don't you think? We're watching so many things, I think, come into play. I think we're seeing the very reason why Israel will have to strike Iran's nuclear facilities because the world is allowing them to march forward to a nuclear weapon. And as soon as Iran gets one, they would certainly use it against Israel, against Saudi Arabia, against America. And I believe when Israel strikes Iran's nuclear facilities, Iran will turn around together with Russia, who has a significant financial investment 
in Iran with their nuclear facilities, their nuclear technology, they will lead a world army against Israel. The UN is going to come out and say, Israel, that was bad. You shouldn't have done that. Now we're going to come and get you. We're not going to slap you with sanctions. We're going to take you out. And here we come. You can read all about it in Ezekiel 38, 39. You can read about it before the headlines of the world show up. Speaking exactly what the Word of God says. Out of the Christian post, Christian refugees are begging the West to save them from persecution, says Syrian church leader. There's some 158,000 Syrian Catholics begging the West to save them, to stand for the rights of all citizens in Iraq and Syria. But the world's just turning their back on the Christians, turning their back. You know, we saw the Jews go through a holocaust. I believe we will soon see the Christians go through one of their own. There's going to be more than six million killed, though, I can tell you. Out of Fox News, Russian cruise missiles intended for targets in Syria hit Iran instead. Eh, my mistake, comrade. <laughs> Wait, we've had two accidental bombings in the past two days? Hmm, one by America, one by Russia? Really? Are they really accidents? Cruise missiles launched from a Russian warship aimed at targets in Syria, missed their target and crashed in Iran today. Now, I don't think Russia intentionally meant to hit Iran. Who knows, though? <laughs> Launching crew... Have, have you seen this? Here's one out of the Telegraph. Russia launches, launches missiles that ISIL targets from Caspian warships as Assad forces start ground offensive. You realize Russia has boots on the ground. They have trucks and tanks and weapons on the ground in Syria. Boots on the ground. There's a video of them firing these rockets from this warship. It's pretty impressive. Launching dozens of missiles into Syria. Had to travel some 900 miles, striking 11 targets inside Syria. Now understand something here. Isaiah 17.1, prophecy against Damascus, I think has been knocking at the door for the last four years. Wouldn't it, it wouldn't be that far-fetched if Russia accidentally hit Damascus, right? Someone, sometime, I think very soon, is going to be taking out Damascus, whether intentionally or accidentally, and Isaiah 17.1 will come to pass right in front of your eyes. I'm just hoping and praying when it happens that people say, hey, that was written in the Bible, wasn't it? I wonder what else might be true. All of it. <laughs> Hello. It's all true. You might want to read it all because you're going to see the rest of it come to pass. Out of Breitbart, Louis Farrakhan says, Trump and ISIS are signs that God is sending plagues down on America. This guy is, let me just say, he follows exactly the playbook of his father, the devil. Because this Louis Farrakhan is talking about the 10th anniversary of the million, or the 20th anniversary of the Million Man March. He's the leader of the nation of Islam. Understand that, okay? And he said that Republican candidate Donald Trump wanting to make America great again and the success of ISIS are both signs that God is judging the United States. And he said the battle is on, the plagues are coming down on America. And then, guess what he does? He quotes scripture from the Holy Bible. Yeah. He said, you need to be afraid today because the God of justice is present. That's why he said, vengeance is mine. The battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's and God has come. Really? Which God are you talking about, Louis? Because you don't believe in my God. He said, when you, have, when you have done the evil that you have done to us and done it to others, did you ever think there would come a day when you'd have to pay for all the crap that you've done? How about the Native American? Have they been treated with justice? Have the Palestinians been treated with justice? Why is there a revolution brewing in every country on the earth? He says justice is the weapon God will use in the day of judgment, which is right now. 
Again, just like Satan, he gets part of it right, but he twists it just a little, tweaks it some. Have you seen this out of Charisma News? One nation under Allah. What are your kids learning at schools? Do you understand Islamic indoctrination is happening in public schools all across America? <clears throat> in Tennessee and Georgia, all over America, <clears throat> our school kids are being indoctrinated into Islam. From California to Maine, parents are concerned about the teaching of Islam in their schools. It's going well beyond simply teaching about a religion. They're distorting the truth. They're teaching Islam entrenched with all kinds of problems. They're teaching kids to recite the five pillars of Islam. That's the Islamic conversion creed. Like when you, cite, when you say that, you're officially converted to Islam. Understand that. Yet they're not learning about Christianity or Judaism. There's, some schools are telling students that Allah is the same God worshipped by Christians. That's the biggest lie from hell ever. We do not worship the same God as Islam. My God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to save me from sin, death, and hell. Their God has no son, no heir. That alone makes it very obvious we do not worship the same God. My God's a God of love, of mercy, of justice, of peace. Their God's a God of hatred and death and killing. Their God says, kill for me. My God died to save me. Big difference. Learn some truth, people. Islam and Christians do not worship the same God. No way, no how. Don't let anyone try to pull that lie over on you. Students were told to say, Allah is the only God while lessons on Christianity were skipped entirely. Where's the separation of church and state people? Where are they? The ACLJ is all over them, taking them to task, taking them to court. Let's get into the word. <clears throat> In Psalm 18, verse 27, it says, for thou wilt save the afflicted people, but will bring down high looks. Save the afflicted people, but bring down high looks. He'll rescue the humble, but humiliate the proud. In Isaiah 57, Isaiah 57, verse um, 15, it says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Revive the heart of the contrite ones, those who repent. Those giving courage to those who repent. God's grace gives us the tools we need, gives us the ability to be humble. <clears throat> um, huh. You know, humility is not, you know, debasing yourself. It's not destroying your sense of self-worth. It's this honest recognition of our own worth, our, our worth as God sees us. You know, but arrogance and pride make people feel like they're better than others. Understand something, that was Satan's downfall also. The angel Lucifer wanted to be worshiped more than God Almighty in Isaiah 14. He was kicked out of heaven along with a third of the angels. He became the devil himself, Satan. If trying to destroy your own self-worth isn't acceptable, because it denies the very value that God has put upon you, okay? Um, he created us in his image. And he sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross to save us. Christ didn't die for low-life scum. He didn't die for worms. He died for people that he loves very much. He died for people that he seeks to save, that he seeks 
to take their sins away and put his righteousness upon them. That's who he died for. Those people have a great value in God's eyes. They're very valuable to God. We need to see ourselves the way God sees us. He sees the righteousness of Christ on us because Christ has covered us. He's washed away our sins. It's this substitution. Christ died in our place. We should have been on the cross. We should each be put to death for our sins. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And we're all sinners, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Christ took our sins upon himself. That's why God couldn't look upon him when he was on the cross, because God can't look upon sin. And at that moment, Jesus had all the sins of the world, past, present, and future, upon him on that cross. So he took our sins away, and he covered us with his righteousness. We've been clothed with the righteousness of Christ. <clears throat> Let's go to Romans 5, verse 12. Um, Romans 5, verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. All have sinned. You know, tragedy can strike anywhere. We, we, we can probably all remember the tragedy that struck America on September 11th, a few years back, 14 years ago or so. Hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, volcanoes, shootings, killings, wars, tragedy. Tragedy can strike without warning. Yeah, sure, sometimes you see them coming, like hurricanes and tornadoes. Uh, not always, though. I mean, you don't always see earthquakes coming. I mean, they can't really accurately predict those. You can't really predict a volcano. I mean, you can watch the signs and think you're right, but it can blow any time. I think the first tragedy ever in world history was when Adam and Eve went against God. And they ate the forbidden fruit. And sin entered the world. You see, if that wouldn't have happened, we'd all be walking around happy and naked. <laughs> sin has to be the greatest tragedy that ever struck the planet. Bringing evil and wickedness with full force and destruction upon each and every one of us. The impact of that tragedy is still being felt today, this day, thousands of years later. It's being passed from one generation to the next. Not one has been born without sin. Well, there was one. His name was Jesus. And they put him on a cross. The greatest of all tragedies you know, when someone sins, it always impacts someone else. A lot of times people think, oh, no one's going to see this sin. I'll get away with this. I won't tell anybody. That way nobody will know. God knows. And you know. Sin always affects somebody other than just the sinner. It's impossible to think of sin or anything evil that doesn't affect a larger group of people. Sin is felt from every generation since the world began. But there is hope. There is hope. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 5, Jesus conquered sin by his obedient life, by his atonement through his death on the cross. So if you're in Christ, you don't have to let sin have that grip on you. You don't have to be a slave to sin. You're not in bondage to sin any longer. It doesn't have any power over you. Sure, your life is continually impacted because of sin. And we're constantly tempted. But you can stand victoriously over sin and be that light, shining your light into the darkness. 
and give hope to others who have also felt the pain of the tragedy of sin. We should be thanking God every day for sending His Son, Jesus, to take care of this problem of sin for us, giving us salvation, giving us atonement, giving us everlasting life through Jesus Christ the Son, the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to live in the victory that God has given us. We need to walk in that victory and understand we are victorious. We have already overcome. In Luke 11, verse 42, Jesus said, But woe unto you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. Jesus said not to leave the other undone. It's very clear he's not arguing against doing what's right. There's a lot of people when it comes to tithing, they say, oh, that's so Old Testament. No, it's not. Not at all. It too is a commandment to give. Give to the church. Give back to God. Jesus said, you ought to have done this. You know, God's word talks about holiness in our actions. See, the Pharisees were wrong because that's what caused Jesus to rebuke them because they believed their actions would give them this right relationship with God. But a proper relationship with God can only come by humility, by humbling ourselves, by submitting to God and putting faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he did on the cross as being all that's necessary for our salvation. God cleanses our hearts by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, verse 8. And then we have fruit unto holiness, uh, Romans 6, 22. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end, everlasting life. You see, holiness is a fruit. It's not a root of salvation. It's a fruit of salvation. Just like in Matthew 23, verse 26, when Jesus told the Pharisees, Thou blind Pharisees, you know, you cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, but that the outside of them may be clean also. You know, true Christianity comes from the inside out. Starts in the heart, starts in the spirit. A good heart will change a man's actions, but a man's actions will not change a man's heart. See, you got to get it in the right order. I think there's so many religions around the world that say, hey, if you just act right, you're going to be all right. Just be good, and God will be good to you. But that's not true. That's not biblically true. You must be born again, Jesus said in John 3. You must be born again. Not, hey, you know, it'd be a good idea if you're born again, or, you know, if you thought about it and wanted to. It's not a suggestion. He said, you must be born again. There's no negotiating that. You're either born again or you're not. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. There's only two destinations for every person that's ever lived on this planet. Heaven or hell. Pretty simple. The difference is if you accept Jesus or not. Born again. Are you born again? You know, if you're born again, then holiness is actually a byproduct of your relationship with God. It's not the way to a relationship with God. You see, the heart of the gospel is that you must be born again. You must confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Romans 10, verse 9. Every other religion in the world has this moral standard they enforce and that most of the, all of them are all about works. Oh, do this and you'll gain that. You see, Christianity offers salvation through a sinless Savior whose grave is empty. <laughs> His grave is empty because he rose again from the dead, just like he said he would, even though there's billions of people that will deny this because they don't know the truth. They don't know the truth. You know, if you're wanting to present holiness in any other way other than a result of salvation is denying Jesus as Savior, then that puts the burden of salvation on us. And we're simply not capable of saving ourselves. Anyone who thinks we are is very arrogant or foolish or just downright ignorant. Wrong emphasis on 
achieving holiness or salvation through one's own actions will simply damn that person to hell. We must trust Jesus Christ completely, entirely, fully. Okay? Salvation is the work of the Sovereign Lord. In Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Salvation talks about this freedom that's gained when God rescues someone from slavery to sin and makes that person a joint heir with Christ and part of his family. This deliverance can only come through Jesus Christ. There's no other way to God the Father but through Christ the Son. He said so himself in John 14, 6. Some people think if they just live right, if they just do good things and work hard at their job and be good to their family and throw some money in the plate and maybe pray occasionally and stand up when they sing at church, God will accept them. No. God's not going to save us based on how we live, based on your moral standards. Romans 3.10 says there is none righteous. No, not one. Our Acts of holiness are nothing more than filthy rags, Isaiah 64, verse 6 tells us. God can't have dealings with unrighteous, unholy sin for sinners, except through Jesus Christ the Son. God won't accept people because of their goodness. Jesus said no, no one is good but God alone. God is loving. He's good. He's just and perfect. He will not overlook sin, no matter how small you think it is. Pride makes us reject this idea that we need forgiveness or cleansing from sin. Pride's a very deadly attitude. Some people think, oh, if I serve in church, if I, if I do this, if I do that, good works won't get you there. I don't care what anybody says. All of Islam believes if they do good works, they'll attain paradise with their 72 virgins. Makes you wonder, what, what about the women in Islam? Are they going to have 72 virgin guys? I mean, salvation is a work of God's grace. It's not a product of our efforts, okay? When we respond to the Holy Spirit that's moving us, that's guiding us, when we believe in Jesus Christ the Son, and we're born again as God's children like John 3, 3 talks about, then we can be assured of our place in heaven. I'm pretty sure. How about you guys? It's only through Christ and the blood that he spilled for us. In Isaiah 36, verse 5, how are we doing on time? I'll hurry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Isaiah 36, 36? Yeah. Isaiah 36, verse 5, it says, I say, wait, no, that's not it. Yeah, it is. Isaiah 36, 5, I, I say, sayest thou, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom dost thou trust? that thou rebellest against me. On whom do you trust? It's a very important question for you, for me, for everybody. On whom do you trust? The Christian says, I trust in, the, in God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, the Holy Spirit. I trust in the triune God. I trust the Father. I believe he chose me before the beginning of the world, before the foundation of the world. I trust him to provide for me, to provide for me salvation providence to teach me, to guide me, to correct me, to lead me, to protect me. 
to bring me home to his house where they're preparing a mansion for me. I trust the Son, Son of God, God in flesh, the Savior of the world, the Messiah that was prophesied. I trust Jesus Christ. I trust in him completely to take away my sins by his sacrifice on the cross to crown me with a crown of righteousness. I trust him to be my, my intercessor, my mediator between God and me, to present my prayers, my petitions, my needs and desires before the Father's throne, praying on my behalf. I trust him to be my advocate, to plead my case, to sanctify me, to justify me, to purify me. I trust him for what he is, for who he is, for what he's done, and what he's promised yet to do. I trust him completely. I trust him with my life and the life of my family. I trust the Holy Spirit. He's begun a good work in me. I trust him to drive out my sins. I trust him to guide me, to lead me, to strengthen me, to give me wisdom and discernment and guidance and grace. I trust him to help me curb my temper. I trust him to help me bridle my tongue, to subdue my will, to enlighten my understanding. I trust him to strengthen my weakness. I trust him to light up any darkness in me. I trust him to dwell in me as my very life, to reign in me as my king, to sanctify me completely, holy, mind, body, and spirit. That's how we should feel. We need to trust him because he's done everything to gain our trust. Trust the one whose power will never be exhausted, whose kingdom will never be overrun, whose love will never stop, whose kindness will never change, whose mercy endures forever, whose faithfulness will never fail, whose wisdom will never run out, and whose perfect goodness can never end. Trusting, trusting Jesus Christ as Lord, Savior, and King today, this day, will give you a peace and a joy that you simply can't understand, and it will give you glory forever, hereafter, everlasting life. And the very rock of our faith, the very foundation of our trust is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I love you guys. God bless you. Good Lord willing, I'll see you again tomorrow.